David mentioned, my name is John Campo. I'm a natural resources planner with Marin County Parks and Julian Gagan and myself. We're going to bounce back and forth and co-present. Julian is the uh, vegetation ecologist and a fantastic botanist. Um, so we are going to be talking about Bowman Canyon, which is adjacent to Mount Burdell. Um, but I have a little bonus presentation. Um, we have a really exciting project that we've been planning for seven years now, and we broke ground this past summer um, and on Roy's Redwoods. It's in San Geronimo Valley, um, and it's and we're hoping to resume our progress this summer after the owl, the spotted owls have completed their nesting season. And then hopefully this time next year, we can invite CNPS out to a field trip. Um, and Julian and I would, would love to meet folks and, and do a little walk. But so let me go ahead and... So we've had um, some volunteer days out at Roy's Redwoods. And if you've been to Roy's Redwoods in the past, um, in the old growth redwood grove, and this is only one of four old growth redwood groves in Marin. So there's Samuel P. Taylor, Muir Woods, Roy's Redwoods, and then there's an old growth redwood grove um, on the steep ravine trail. And so this is only one of four. Um, this one at Roy's, it never had a formal designated trail system. Um, folks just kind of walked where they wanted to, shotgun all over the, the landscape. And as a result, it really caused a lot of disturbance. It caused a lot of soil compaction. And we lost a lot of vegetation, actually it even impacted the hydrology. Um, so John, should we be seeing your, your slides now? Yeah, you're not seeing it? No, we're mm -hmm. just seeing your desktop. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, <clears throat> let's try that again. How's that? Yes. Yes. Thanks, Julian. And so creating that formal designated trail system, we really want to encourage people to stay on trail. And then as a, in, within the process, we will be decompacting soils and revegetating re the site with thousands of native plants that will be growing in our nursery. Um, this was a rock staircase that was, it was started with a staff member who was a seasonal at the time, um, worked on with some volunteers, and this is what it looks like today. It's completed and it's really a work of art. It's it's a site worth seeing in, in and of itself. Um, we we actually hired the seasonal full time. It was like, wow, this is a great project. He's got a great skill set. Um, so this is a the trail that leads up to the Roy's Loop Trail. Additionally, there was a lot of little touches um, with the work that we completed out there to date. Um, this is part of the trail system, and oftentimes we have to buttress the edge of the trail with boulders, or you can see logs over here. Um, in this case, we weren't thrilled about these boulders that we brought in. They were new and shiny, and we really wanted them to fit the character of the redwood forest. Um, so actually, Julian mossified the rocks, and so we actually... Um, Actually, Julian, why don't you talk about this since this was your little project? Sure, yeah, this was um, kind of a fun little um, side project that myself and Asia Matthews, our uh, nursery manager, undertook at John's request. Um, so we, <laughs> we tried out a few different methods just to see what would work. Um, and this one, we were mixing up some collected moss with buttermilk, which uh, has some sort of magical properties, I've been told, that will help uh, moss to kind of stick to surfaces. Um, we also tried just like direct transplant with mud. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun and a little bit silly, but we had a really good time. And, you know, the result looks good. And, um, you know, now that we've had one winter of rainy weather, the moss has like fully established itself on the rocks. And, um, you know, you would never know that we were there. It's really great. Yeah, it's, I was there just last week and the, the moss is thriving. So um, 
nevertheless, this trail will probably be known as the Mossy Rocks Trail. Not, not only are these rocks mossy, there's beautiful giant boulders out there fully covered in moss. Um, so it's, it's a really wonderful trail. Um, additionally, you know, we took, we've taken a lot of care at the site. And as we started to create this formal designated trail system, there was some mature ferns that were in the path. And we did not want to harm one single fern. Um, you know, probably many folks on this call know that a fern that size can take 10, 15 years to grow. And we want every one of those ferns back in the site. So we painstakingly carried these all off site. We have them in our nursery. We're going to care for them. And then next winter, we'll plant them back out when the hardscaping of the project is complete. Um, additionally, we worked with the Marin Master Gardeners to collect native propagules. And we've been collecting seed at Roy's, as well as other places to to grow a plant palette that we plan to revegetate the site with for many years to come. Um, once the construction is done, we're gonna decompact soils and we will revegetate the forest floor, which is, it has been severely impacted actually. So, so that's it for uh, Roy's. Um, I'm gonna go on to now Bowman Canyon. Um, at the end of the presentation, Julian or I would be happy to answer any questions about Roy's. So switching gears a little bit, Bowman Canyon is actually adjacent to Mount Burdell. So if you see this map, so this blue polygon, this was the property that we're calling Bowman Canyon. It was acquired about four years ago, and it's about 400 acres. Um, so Mount Burdell proper is about 1,500 acres. So now this is it's one contiguous piece of land. And then to the north is Mount Olompoli. Um, so it's a very big open space. And so for us to first to get to know the property, we really took a deep dive in, into a site analysis to, to understand the property better. It was a private ranch that had been privately owned for many decades. It's never been public land. We didn't really know much about it at all. Um, so we engaged with um, staff botanists like Julian, and we also worked with Nomad Ecology, um, Heath Bartosh, um, to do a deep dive vegetation assessment on the parcel. Uh, we worked with staff wildlife biologists, as well as others to get an understanding of the aquatic wildlife, as well as the terrestrial wildlife. Um, this photo here is this Julian, I think that's you there, Julian, um, working on um, uh, invasive barbed goat grass. Um, so also Julian had done extensive mapping of the invasive species population. Julian, do you wanna say a few words about that here? Uh, yeah, so the barbed goat grass at Bowman Canyon was one of the first um, weed priorities that we identified out there. And we actually um, wanted to get um, like a head start managing that. So as soon as we realized it was out there, and this was actually like one of the first things we did in 2020 after we all came back to work, was we got out there and pulled all the goat grass from um, that fire road through the serpentine grassland, which we'll talk about more um, in a little bit. Um, and we've been back every year since just to completely um, try to get every last inflorescence, which is not an easy task. All right, so in addition to those vegetation wildlife assessments, we also did um, road assessments and trail assessments. And so we, we actually, whenever we acquire new property, um, you may have heard we're working on, um, or the county's working on acquisition of the Martha property in Tiburon. Um, we're recently acquiring the old San Geronimo golf course. So the point I'm trying to make is we never get a piece of land that's uh, virgin territory. It's It always has something going on with it. And so this was no different. There was an extensive network of ranch roads, so five miles of roads, these black dashed lines, and then a, a pretty extensive um, social trail network 
that, that the previous landowner had allowed the mountain biking community specifically to make pretty significant series of mountain bike trails in this area. Um, so when we when we got the property, we did uh, post the, the roads as public access. Um, so starting four years ago, you could go out there and walk around and explore. Um, the, the roads are, are mapped, they're on our public maps, they have these wayfinding posts and you're welcome to go walk around the site. It, although that's not really necessarily a planned public access, that's just our inherited public access. And that's really what this talk is all about is how we planned or, or are in the process of planning the public access. So again, when we get these ranch roads or logging roads or skid roads, they're typically not good for recreation and they're, they're certainly almost never sustainable. Um, this was one of the roads that um, is very steep. It doesn't drain well. There's a fair amount of erosion. The creek road interfaces are, are not good. In fact, there was a lot of trash and debris, a lot of asphalt in the creek, um, which was a common practice in the older days. The Army Corps of Engineers actually told you to throw your old car into the creek to stabilize the bank. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, but then again, a lot of the roads are, are very steep. And some of them, like this is the road along the ridgetop, we would likely retain. It's, it's stable, uh, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful walk. It, it's a climb to get up there, but once you're up there, it's, it's worth the views. And so um, just to talk a, a little bit more about the wildlife assessments, um, we did extensive nesting surveys, ground nesting surveys. Um, this photo is a, a burrow. Um, so we, we always do burrowing surveys in grasslands that may be suitable habitat for burrowing owls or badgers um, in aquatic habitat, looking for any types of amphibians, Western pond turtles, red-legged frogs. Um, we didn't find any um, red-legged frogs or Western pond turtles, but recognize this aquatic habitat as having good potential. And so maybe with some enhancements in the future, um, we could get a population of, of red-legged frogs established. They are um, breeding not too far from here. So um, juvenile or sub-adult red-legged frogs typically can travel about two miles and they're within two miles. So they could very well find this site. Um, but we did find badgers, and that was a really neat find. Um, we set up a game camera. Um, they're triggered by motion. And so we captured uh, photos of badger um, in this area here. And so badgers are, they're not, um, well, they're pretty rare in Marin. We don't have them in a lot of places. And so that for us, that's we consider that to be a significant find and a significant habitat worth protecting. And so we identified this area, this south facing grassland as a habitat that we really didn't want to disturb. Um, so that's that aquatic habitat I was mentioning. It's right here. Um, again, we think with some enhancements, we could get a, a, a population of red-legged frogs established. So that's something that we're going to look to in the future. We also found a turkey vulture nest. Um, which is not super common for us to at least find them. They're out there, but we there was a, tr a bay cavity, a bay tree cavity, and they were nesting inside of there. So we acknowledge that. And th well, that's it for wildlife. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Julian. He's going to be able to explain the vegetation assess assessment in much greater detail than I. Um, so I'll turn it over to Julian now. Thank you, John, and thanks everybody for having me here. I'm Julian Gagan. I'm the Vegetation Specialist with Marin County Parks. And I'm going to talk to you all about the vegetation out at Bowman Canyon and our efforts over the last few years to fully understand it. Um, and there are really two aspects to that understanding. Um, one is the individual plant species that are present at the preserve. Um, what taxa are actually there, and in particular, looking for any rare and endangered species that may be present. Um, 
And I'll go into more detail about each of those species a little bit later. Um, it's also important to know which common plant species are present because species richness is one of the basic metrics of biodiversity. Um, so we also want to know what non-native and invasive species are present because we want to start prioritizing our weed management out there. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit as we go along, um, but it's very important data to collect because that's what really informs our our day-to-day -day conservation efforts. You know, weed management is 90% of my job. So um, that's sort of the most actionable data that we collect. Um, the other major component of a vegetation assessment and the one that gets a little bit less attention is the uh, vegetation classification. And this is the process of mapping and defining the vegetation types within an area. You know, so for example, your bay forest, valley oak woodland, needle grass, grassland, um, et cetera. And this effort is important for a few reasons. Um, one is just that it helps us to better understand the broader ecological function of an area. You know, vegetation is one of the major components of any species habitat, whether it's an animal or a plant or a fungus or whatever else. Um, so having vegetation data will inform our wildlife management, it will inform our rare plant surveys, um, so on and so forth. Uh, but vegetation types are also significant just within in themselves in that they are a biological unit. Um, many people think of plant communities almost like they're super organisms, you know, these assemblages of different, of different um, taxa that are unique in themselves. So um, that should be recognized and protected in the same way that the species is. Um, so to that end, there is, there is a list of sensitive natural communities. Um, that's how CDFW refers to them. Um, so now in the same way you can have a rare species, you can have a rare vegetation type. And you know, I know that CMPS was really um, integral in the development of, of that list and that protocol and that approach. Um, you know, so those are some of the things that we want to capture you know, during our vegetation assessment. Um, all right, next slide, please. Uh, so now I want to get into the specifics of Bowman Canyon, and we'll start by talking about the vegetation classification. Um, we now have two data sets that cover Bowman Canyon. Uh, the first one that you see here being the Marin County-wide fine scale vegetation map. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. It came out a few years ago, I think 2019 something like that. Um, it's a project of the OneTam Collaborative, and it's particularly valuable to us because it provides continuous vegetation cover over the entire county. Um, so public land, private land, everything, everywhere. And that's really cool for us um, because, for example, if we acquire a new parcel like Bowman Canyon or the Martha property or any other future open space, preserves, um, we already have a ready-made vegetation map at our fingertips, and we can start the process of, of planning um, sort of on the right foot. Um, there are some limitations to it, though, um, because it was produced through remote sensing um, for the most part. There was definitely a lot of field work involved, but for the most part, it was an airplane flying over the county, taking photographs, and then we have aerial imagery, which a computer analyzes and um, assigns, you know, stands, draws vegetation stands, and then assigns a vegetation classification to each stand based on the visual, visual signature in the image. Um, can't tell you exactly how that works because that's not my field of expertise, uh, but I can tell you that it does a pretty good job of classifying woody vegetation types. So your forests, your woodlands, your chaparral, your scrublands. Um, it does like a pretty remarkable job of recognizing those species and assigning those classifications accurately. Um, but what it's not able to do is recognize herbaceous vegetation types. Um, so pretty much all grasslands are just labeled California annual and perennial grasslands. Um, like you can see on this map, though, all those tan areas. 
Um, so it's not telling us whether it's native, whether it's non-native, what species are uh, characteristic or dominant. Um, so that's that's a pretty big data gap that, that we need to fill in. And for some reason, there's a few um, polygons missing from this map. I'm not quite sure how that happened with the export, but we have all the data. Um, all right, next slide. Which is why uh, we developed uh, this vegetation map. Uh, this was produced by Heath Bartosh at Nomad Ecology, who, as John mentioned, we worked with on a number of our uh, botanical assessments out at Bowman. Um, and you can really see just how much a higher resolution this map is compared to the other one. Um, we've gone from just like a handful of vegetation types on the previous map. Um, now we have over a dozen. Um, and in particular, you can see how those herbaceous plant communities have been broken out. Um, so that tan color now corresponds to the um, Bromus dandrus hordiaceus brachypodium distachyon alliance, which is dominated by invasive annual grasses. Um, but we also have those pink polygons, which are our Stipopulcra herbaceous alliance. So those are characterized by um, stands of Stipopulcra. And we also have that sort of pistachio green polygon up in the top right corner that's labeled as the Lacinia Californica Plantago Erecta Alliance, or association in this case, I think. Um, but that's our serpentine grassland. So these different herbaceous plant communities, vegetation classifications have been um, sort of carved out from that one giant blobby polygon. And that's like really valuable data to have. Um, all right, next slide, please. So another product of the vegetation classification process is the vegetation management zone map. Um, this is a map that we have for all of our open space preserves for the entire district. Um, and essentially what has happened here is we've kind of carved up the preserve into these four zones that are sort of based on the generalized ecological value of the area. Um, so like down by Novato Boulevard there, we have the highly disturbed zone, which is gray, and then kind of in increasing sort of general value, we have the natural landscape zone, which is that kind of yellowish green, and then the sustainable natural system zone, which is a medium green, and then the legacy zone, which is our kind of highest value areas, which is the dark green. Um, this is like a tool that we use to plan and manage our open space preserves. And since we, you know, acquired Bowman Canyon after the management zone process was completed, we sort of had to um, integrate that into the larger management zone map. And just as kind of a, a rough guideline to these zones, they have kind of long names, but the highly disturbed zone is those places that have just been heavily impacted by human activity, either heavy equipment or agriculture. Um, and they're like heavily dominated by invasive plant species. So yeah, like John's pointing out that zone behind the homes uh, at Mount Burdell, like that's the mo zone you know, those areas get mowed every year as part of the defensible space work because they're right next to homes. Um, that area down by Nevada Boulevard is an agricultural field. So it gets mowed and fertilized and all sorts of stuff that is not conducive to having a native plant community. Um, the natural landscape zone is sort of a step up from that. And these areas are um, they're generally dominated by invasive plant species, I would say is the kind of characteristic. So these are all of our invasive annual European grasslands or, um, you know, French broom forests. Um, these places are sort of degraded in, in a ecological sense, but they still have a lot of ecological value because you know many wildlife species don't really care if 
the plants are native or non-native. Um, and a lot of invasive plants can still perform ecological functions that are important for states, you know, sustaining um, wildlife and um, controlling erosion, et cetera. So we don't like to think of these places as worthless or, or wastelands. You know, they still have, you know, an intrinsic open space value to them. Um, but they are very weedy. <laughs> But so a step up from that, the sustainable natural system zone, which is that kind of medium green color. These places are usually characterized by native plant species. So, uh, you know, on this map, we have all of our, our oak woodlands, our bay forests, um, the uh, chemise chaparral, these kind of places that are uh, native plant communities, but they're relatively common. Um, you can find them throughout the region, throughout the state, etc. Whereas the legacy zones, the darkest green, these are places that have some kind of unique quality to them, either um, the serpentine substrate or rare plant populations, or like the area on this map over by San Andreas Fire Road, that's the, um, that old lava flow that has the dwarf oaks and other cool rare plants growing on it. So that's not serpentine, but it is a unique um, plant community, a unique geologic feature that um, creates shallow soils. And um, even though Quercus agrifolia is a very common species in the state, you know, the fact that those individuals are growing uh, like a, in a diminutive fashion because of the substrate, that's a unique quality that um, kind of stands out on this map. Uh, so yeah. That sums up the vegetation management zones, I think. Um, next slide. So now I'm just gonna talk about a, a few things that kind of stood out from that uh, vegetation classification effort. Um, the first one, the most notable one, is the serpentine grassland up in the uh, northeast corner of Bowman Canyon. Um, you know, this is a really special place. It's serpentine substrate dominated by native bunch grasses, a diverse suite of serpentine endemic wildflowers, a number of very rare species, a number of locally rare species, um, really abundant wildflower displays, um, which I think some of you are maybe going on a trip to view shortly. Um, so yeah, this is, you can see the picture there. It's got this really, um, interesting topography to it with these, um, you know, serpentine boulders, barrens, and outcrops um, in a matrix of, um, you know, really impressive native bunch grasses. Uh, next slide. So here's another kind of close-up shot showing um, the kind of lay of the land out there. Um, you can see some native wildflowers, some poppies, et cetera, coming up. Um, there's also some really cool oak trees in this area. You know, it's, it's mostly a grassland, but there are scattered oak trees, um, some really cool uh, Quercus agrifolia, and also Quercus dorata, the leather oak, with some really cool um, mistletoe growing in it. You know, um, when you're hiking up that fire road through the serpentine grassland, you can see that really cool leather oak at the top with um, mistletoe growing in it. Um, and there's also some kind of interesting, I think they might be hybrids. I, I haven't really investigated it. So maybe um, if you see any funny oaks out on your uh, walks out there, let me know and we can take a closer look. Uh, all right, next slide. And here's another spot that I find uh, really fascinating. So this is a stand of chemise chaparral, um, which is a fairly common um, vegetation type in Marin and in the state. Um, but in Marin, it's mostly concentrated in the southern half of the county. And you don't find a lot of this um, plant community in North Marin and around Novato. You know, it's just this kind of sore thumb of chemise chaparral sticking out of the hillside with none other, nowhere else to be found around it. And I'm not sure why it's there and nowhere else, um, but I find it very interesting that it is. 
and um, there are also a few rare plant species that are growing in those drainages along either side. Um, there's some really cool clematis that kind of clambers over the uh, chemise. Um, it is a fairly decadent stand. It's it's hasn't burned in a long time, um, and you know hopefully we live to see the day when uh, it gets a good burn through and we get some really cool wildflowers coming up in there. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to kind of pivot to the floristics of Bowman Canyon. So looking at the individual plant species uh, that we've found out there. Um, since acquisition in 2019, uh, we've done a half dozen or so botanical surveys, um, some of which have been floristic in nature, meaning that we're identifying every detectable plant within a survey area, while other surveys have focused on specific species, um, you know, trying to ensure that we have the most detailed data that we can get uh, for that taxon. Um, another reason is that the, the acquisition was split into two phases. So there was like the Southern section and then the Northern section. So some of the surveys had to be repeated as, you know, as we required the Northern section, we then had to do more surveys. Um, so we've, you know, put a lot of time and energy into surveying um, all these different areas. So what you're looking at here, this is uh, what our rare plant data set for Bowman Canyon looked like at the end of 2022. So this is like our first three years of data collection, um, which mostly focused on that phase one because we had it for longer at that point. Um, but what you see, we have the uh, Marin Dwarf Flax, Hesperolinum congestum, which is a 1B.1 uh, state and federally threatened species most famous from Ring Mountain, but there's a few other scattered sites um, in the Water District, Gary Giacomini, and um, I think down in like the Edgewood Preserve area as well. Um, so that's that blue polygon that you see in the serpentine grassland, uh, fairly widespread um, throughout the grassland. It actually seems to prefer like a sort of happy medium of, of density you know, it doesn't really like growing in the, the super barren areas where we associate a lot of our, our serpentine endemics. Um, it doesn't like too much grass cover, but in those sort of Goldilocks zones with, I don't know, semi-sparse perennial grass cover, it, it really becomes abundant. Um, and then that red polygon that uh, is kind of above and below it there, that's the uh, Tiburon buckwheat. Um, Ariogonum luteolum, luteolum caninum, um, which is sort of an interesting taxon. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the, the questions around that, that species. You know, obviously in Tiburon, we have the Tiburon buckwheat, and then it sort of intergrades with the more common um, variety luteolum as you go north. But in, in the interests of being conservative in our conservation, we'll call it Tiburon buckwheat. Um, and that's growing in the sort of more sparsely vegetated, like the serpentine barrens. There's actually that southern red polygon there that had been bulldozed at some point in the past. I'm not sure why. Maybe there was some cattle infrastructure up there or something. Um, but it loves that, you know, scraped serpentine soil. So they created some Tiburon buckwheat habitat in that process. Um, so what else do we have? In that green polygon farther to the south, uh, that's where we have some Napa false indigo, which is a cool rare shrub. Um, it's, you know, a deciduous shrub, so it's a really fun thing to find in the spring as it's leafing out. You know, we don't have a ton of rare shrubs like that, aside from manzanitas and cenothus. So it's kind of a cool, unique plant. Um, and then the purple polygons, uh, which are growing in that bay forest there and to the south, and also mixed in with the uh, Napa false indigo around the chemise stand. Um, that's our Franciscan onion. Um, 
And that's, this is actually the first time this species was detected in Marin County. Um, so that's um, Allium peninsular vera variety franciscanum, which is a 1B.2, um, previously unrecorded in Marin. So that was like a very exciting find um, when it was located out here. Um, and we have actually since found a couple more spots like at Little Mountain, which is across the road, across Nevada Boulevard from Bowman Canyon. It's, you know, it sort of got the wheels turning. Well, if it's here, you know, where else do we have similar habitat that we could go look for this species? So we did and we found some, which was really exciting. You know, it's right across the road um, to the south. And uh, last but not least, the uh, lobs buttercup, which is an aquatic species that was found growing in that pond that John showed you. It's like an old cattle pond, so it's sort of a decrepit earthen dam that's essentially failed. And then we get this kind of um, almost vernal pool-like situation where it fills up during the winter, but then drains and dries out during the summer. Um, and this is one of the, the rare species that we also have over at um, Hidden Lake. Um, so, you know, John has talked about the wildlife potential of this site and I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, are there any other rare species like maybe Baker's Navaricia that, that would thrive in this place? Um, so there's maybe some potential there to do some cool um, introduction of rare plant species to appropriate habitat. Um, all right, so, well, actually, could you go back for one second, John? Yeah, um, so this is what the data looked like at the end of 2022, so about a year and a half ago. Um, but there are still some data gaps on this map. So the, the western half of that serpentine grassland, um, that's still completely blank because um, when the original surveys were done, we didn't own it yet. So we needed to fill in that information. Uh, we were also concerned about potential gaps in our Franciscan onion mapping, um, just because, uh, you know, it's a fairly dense bay for us. So it takes a lot of um, care to get a complete picture of something growing in a um, sort of hard to survey place. Um, so last year, 2023, um, we spent many hours, many days with both our staff, myself, and Nomad Ecology, uh, just trying to complete that vegetation picture. We wanted to fill in all of the data gaps that I mentioned, and we also wanted to complete floristic surveys over the entire trail project footprint. Um, so yeah, next slide. Um, so that's what's represented here by these dark blue polygons, that trail project footprint. Um, you can see the survey corridor kind of snaking its way around. That's where the, the proposed trails are going to be created. Um, you also see that that entire bay forest is included in the survey. And that's not because that entire thing is going to become a, a trail. It's because we knew that the Franciscan onion was scattered throughout that area. And we wanted to have a complete detailed inventory of that plant community so that we then have the flexibility to put the trail in the most appropriate location based on the survey results. Um, you know, so that's just why that survey area is, is so large. You know, we put a lot of energy and effort into, into getting that part right. All right, next slide. Okay, so here is what we found. This is our 2023 expanded vegetation data set. So this is essentially what we have now. Um, you know, regarding the Franciscan onions, you can see there are now some little pinkish polygons that have been overlaid on top of the original purple polygons. Um, so the pink ones are our new 2023 data. Uh, which corresponded pretty darn well with our earlier data. Uh, you know, there weren't any really major differences, which is good. You know, that means we did a pretty decent job the first go around. Um, we did pick up a few small additional patches uh, on the east side of the bay for us. So now we're confident that we have 
very thorough understanding of that uh, species distribution in this area. And that will be really important for the trail planning process. Um, you can also see that the, the western half of the serpentine grassland um, has been filled in with buckwheat and flax polygons. And we've also refined the polygons, the original polygons to a higher resolution. Um, and it's not shown on this map, but we also broke it up into areas of higher density and areas of lower density so that we could get like a really clear sense of where this plant is growing and, and what um, sort of micro habitats it's, it's occupying in the serpentine grassland. Um, you also notice there's like a little yellow polygon right there where John's pointing with the cursor on the left side of the serpentine grassland. Um, that's a patch of Streptanthus anomalous, uh, Mount Burdell dual flower uh, that we located last year. And uh, that's a pretty major conservation finding. Um, there are only two other known sites for the species. One is on MCOSD property over on the east side of Burdell, um, where it was originally located, I think, by some CNPS folks. Um, so thank you for that. And the other one is on private property farther to the north. So, you know, that's a 50% a increase in known population sites for this species, which is, is pretty significant. Um, I will say there is also some growing um, to the north across Bowman Creek, sort of over by those solar panels, which is not our property, but you can see them with binoculars from our property, if you're curious to, to investigate that. Um, and this, this site is actually kind of cool because I don't know if anybody's familiar with this species, but the, the sort of southeast site has kind of um, uh, yellowish sepals. And then the northern site on private property has like wine red sepals. And, um, you know, they're the same species, but just two different phenotypes. And then this patch has sort of intermediate, like is mostly yellowish, but then some were red and some were kind of in between, like yellow with a little bit of a red blush to them. So, you know, I found that interesting as kind of a bridge between these two known sites. And obviously I haven't visited the one on private property, but um, I've seen pictures of it. And I think this picture right here is from, uh, I think I took that one at this site. So it kind of has both phenotypes co-occurring. Um, all right. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, sum it up. We've done five years of surveys. Uh, we have a pretty comprehensive understanding of the flora of Bowman Canyon um, in terms of vegetation classification, floristics, special status species, um, as well as invasive plant species. And you know, I mentioned earlier the barbed goat grass that we've been managing out there for the last um, four years. Um, and um, we can already see that population declining. Um, at this point, it's mostly restricted to the fire road. Um, it hasn't spread outside of that road corridor yet. And that's what we're trying to prevent from happening because uh, barbed goat grass is a particular threat because it, you know, it's native to serpentine habitats in the Mediterranean. So it's very well adapted to invading our serpentine grasslands. Um, you know, there are serpentine grasslands in Marin that are just totally taken over by barbed goat grass. And we really don't want that to happen here. Um, we've been heavily managing the barbed goat grass at Mount Burdell. Um, for many years. And so we just were able to kind of rope this site into our Mount Burdell management. Um, and, you know, it's incredibly tedious work going out and trying to find these individual grass plants in a field of grass. Um, but we have a great uh, seasonal crew every year who puts a lot of effort and really, you know, attention to detail into pulling all of the goat grass there. Um, the other major invasive plant species effort that we've been putting in out here is what we call our early detection rapid response surveys, EDRR. 
um, for your jargon. Uh, and what that is, is surveying mostly the roads and trails because those are the kind of routes that invasive plant species tend to use to access, you know, new areas. Um, so surveying all the roads and trails for invasive plant species, as well as any other spots, like, you know, there aren't any homes bordering this preserve, luckily, because those are often the places where like garden escapes come in. Um, so we do a lot of EDRR around, you know, the, the wildland urban interface. Um, and, you know, we've picked up, let's see, I have a list here. We found purple star thistle, yellow star thistle, catoni aster, medusa head, French broom, um, privet, olives, phalaris, Reseda luteola, which is not one that we often find. You know, there's some out at Stafford Lake that I've seen. Um, you know, blackberry. Um, so we're 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 trying to get a sort of complete inventory of our invasive plant species out there, while also treating them and removing them at the same time. So um, we have seasonal employees who. Um, are focused on doing early detection rapid response surveys throughout the open space district. Um, yeah, I think at this point, I'll turn it back over to John and he can finish out our presentation. All right, thanks, Julian. So just to, to remind folks, Julian and Nomad Ecology took this deep dive into the vegetation communities out there to really inform the public access planning process. Um, and so just to briefly mention, we have a road and trail management plan and, and really the, the three goals of this document, reduce the environmental impacts of roads and trails on sensitive natural resources, improve the visitor experience and safety for all users and establish and maintain a sustainable system of roads and trails. And so to, to go about that, we really needed to understand what was there. And so we took the last four years to really do that. Um, additionally, we've had many stakeholder meetings um, with environmental groups, recreational groups, equestrians, neighbors, to kind of get an understanding of where they were interested in going and, you know, what kind of trail connections would we make? Um, so these are the three goals that I just mentioned, our, our TMP goals, but then there was these additional goals that kind of came out of those stakeholder conversations. So what trail connections would we make with Mount Burdell? Um, reducing redundant roads. Um, oftentimes these ranch roads, there might be two of them that go to the same place and so we don't need that. Um, separating recreational use. So many of you may know there's been some tension with different recreational groups and so we wanted to try and provide um, a hiking and equestrian route to the summit and then a biking uh, route to the summit. And then also providing an alternative to the Dwarf Oak Trail for, for bikes. We have heard complaints that bikes use dwarf oak. We don't want that to be the case. So let's try and provide a place where that they can go. And so they stay off dwarf oak. And so just kind of looking at the existing conditions out there, again, these black dashed lines are the existing roads and five miles and then four miles of trails. And so then in 2022, after the first round of vegetation assessments, this was our first um, look at a public access plan. So we identified these roads in the serpentine habitat and we uh, omitted those from the first planning process. And then we looked at this um, kind of social trail network of yellow trails and we reimagined it to look more like this. And so this was our first concept in 2022. We heard more feedback um, from th these two trails, from this neighborhood community, they, they weren't thrilled about these two, so we removed those from the planning process. And so this is where we were left with. Um, and then as Julian had kind of outlined, we did that um, additional deep dive in 2023 to look at the, to get a more refined image of the vegetation community. And then with that new data, 
we ref refined the trail planning process again. And so we looked at these areas. Again, this is where the Franciscan onion were located and over here. And so we modified the plan again. And so just looking at this section right here, this we ended up modifying the trail to use more of the existing road, um, less new trail and to avoid the Franciscan onion communities. And then same over here, we actually just use more of the existing road, um, creating less new trail and avoiding the, any Franciscan onion populations. So those were the more recent modifications to it. Again, when you see the serpentine habitat, we took all the trails and, and roads out of this area. You, you can still hike in on the serpentine fire road coming back through the area. And then, and I should note, um, this if you're if you're without a bike, a horse, or a dog, you can still walk in this area. So that doesn't mean you're not allowed to go wildflower viewing. You still are. You just can't do it with a bike, a horse, or a dog. Um, we this is a super sensitive area, obviously, and we we want to limit that kind of recreation in that area. So where we're at now, um, this is our most recent proposal. We had nine miles of trails we're proposing eight um there was a uh, repurposing of and using eight, three miles of existing roads and trails and then you know this plan will certainly improve the visitor experience and then we're moving roads and trails from sensitive habitat and so i think finally just to talk a little about designation um so this this trail right here this is a designated as a hiking horse connection. And so this red dashed line is the Dwarf Oak Trail. Um, so this is also a hiking horse connection. So we want to maintain that for hikers and equestrians. To, and this is the summit right here. Um, this would be a multi-use connection. So again, this is connecting from Burdell proper um, around this kind of sensitive serpentine, not only serpentine, but very wet area as well. Um, and so to connect up with the serpentine fire road. And then this trail right here would be a multi-use connection that would take you to the summit. So on this one, bikes could go up it only. They can't, bikes would not be allowed to go down it. And then hikers and horses could go up or down. And then this trail, again, this is the summit. And then this trail would be a bike downhill only and hikers could go up or down. And then finally, this one over here would be a multi-use connection. And the reason why this one is here is because if you drive into Bowman Canyon off, of, here's Nevada Boulevard here, you would pull in and this red circle, this is where we've kind of created shoulder parking. Technically, this is the end of the public road. And so this is where you park. Um, and so this, this road that goes further back is not for public access. And so for the CNPS field trip though, it will, will be okay to park back here. Um, I'll let the ranger staff know and they'll be expecting you. And so, you know, that's it for the presentation. And so really where this is at is we're gonna work on developing the project description for an environmental review period. Um, which will probably be later next year. And then we would hear additional public comments at that point. I think that's it, David. Hey, thank you, John and Julian. I, I, I have to say, I'm really impressed with the, uh, the care you've exercised in surveying and mapping the natural resources of, the, of Bowman Canyon and, and your use of how sensitively you've used that in the planning process. And, and I really want to congratulate you and thank you for for that kind of care uh, the uh one question in the uh the chat from vernon and doreen smith did you access the geology for planning map of mount burdell and the marin cnps plant checklist um well the marin cnps plant checklist i use pretty much every day of my life <laughs> they're um indispensable resource. So yes to that. 
Um, the geology for planning map, I mean, we do have geologic data that we, you know, spatial data that we use with our uh, mapping software. So I'm not sure if that's different from what I, I have been using. Um, so if you want to point me at that document or that data, I would love to investigate and see if it's something new. So if Vernon or Doreen, if you want to unmute and uh, elaborate on that, feel free. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we go. Waiting for you to respond. I don't know. <laughs> Just say you're on, you're on the voice. Oh, it's I'm on voice now. Tell me, technology has escaped me again. Look, if you want to ask me any questions, you you can easily email me. I don't have texting or a cell phone or anything. Um, but the um, Streptanthus anomalous was found on, you know, as you know, on the east side of Burdell. There also were other things like Monolopia major, which is not elsewhere in Marin. And the, the top of um, Mount Burdell has an unusual yellow flowered plant. I can't remember the name of. You have to get me before my memory goes completely, I tell you. <laughs> so if, if I know the answer to mm -hmm. any Richard. questions where a certain plant is, I can tell you right now, maybe in five years, I would have forgotten it. Yeah. I, will, I, will, I will send you an email with any questions yeah. I have. Thank yeah. you. I'm not keeping it to myself. <laughs> and uh, Clint, Clint, Clint Kellner asked, do you know what type of management such as grazing will occur in Bowman Canyon? Yeah, there, there has been historic cattle grazing on Bowman Canyon, um, uh, as is there on uh, Mont Burdell proper. Um, the grazing at Bowman is pretty light. There's not a huge head of cattle. I, I don't know the exact numbers. And I'm I'm not too involved in how the cattle are rota rotated around, but it it is cattle grazed. Hey, that's that's all that I see in the chat. Uh, any of you have questions, feel free to unmute and ask them. Uh, it looks like we don't have any. So I, I want to thank you both Julian and John for really a very informative presentation. I've been out to Bowman Canyon twice and, and I want to say it is spectacular. Uh, it's one of the few places that that you, you can you can really see nice swaths of Clarkia, for example, and uh, it, it, the right season. It's just a lot of a lot of very I'm, interesting plants. I mean, uh, and the uh, John and Julian focused on the, the the rarities, but I want to tell you that there there's a lot more out there of, of the common uh, plants, and there are a lot of them, and it's just gorgeous. Uh, so I, I encourage you to get out there at some time in the spring. Uh, I think you really, really enjoy it. Uh, so again, thanks so much. Uh, before we leave, I, I want to again go... Uh, go back to Christine and just uh, emphasize her needs for the our needs for the plant sale uh, for any latecomers that, that didn't get her message at the beginning. Yeah, thank you. Rather than speaking at all, um, I put the details in the chat. So if you just scroll up higher in the in the chat, you'll see a description of what what sort of help we need for the plant sale. And then I can announce that our, our program will be a map science and she will talk about um, their propagation of um, native plants and restoration projects that they're conducting so hope you can join uh, christine i'll repeat that again because you were breaking up yeah and my connection is a little yeah. sketchy alicia Matz, who's the restoration project manager of uh, point blue conservation is going to discuss their restoration projects and their nursery propagation program and that will be on Monday, May 13th, same time, 7.30. So again, thank you for coming. And again, thank you, Julian and John. And uh, we hope to see you all next month. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.